How you doing everybody? My name is Mike and I am on a mission to find out everything I can about the knife business. So I've come to Dexter Russell headquarters in Southbridge, Massachusetts to find out everything I can because you know what? These guys have been doing this for 200 years and if they don't know quality, nobody will. So come on, let's go inside, find out what's going on and how these tools for chefs are made to the best quality standards and as effective as possible all the answers are inside. Come on. Kevin, thank you so much for having me at Dexter. I cannot wait to see how all of your tools are built. It all happens right here, Mike. So I know I'm gonna see a lot of stuff, but give me a preview. Get ready, fasten your seatbelt. You're gonna see technology out there that no one else in the world does. We're actually, um, we're, we're, we're glad to have you with your camera and all, but in some respects, we want to make sure that uh, we, we monitor that because there are some things we do that, quite frankly, it's, it's our special thing that we do and we don't necessarily share all that data. And I think you'll see too with the people, you'll see the commitment in their face and you'll see the pride in their manufacturing and you'll see the pride in what they do each and every day. Perfect. Well, I am ready to don my glasses and head into the factory now. Thank you for warning me ahead of time <laughs> what I'm about to see. I can't even believe I'm going to get to see top secret technology. I can't wait. So thank you so much for taking the time and I'll tell you how it goes. You're sure welcome. Have a great day. You too. All right, this is it. I'm going through this door to the factory where it all goes down. I'm going in uneducated and I'm coming out the other side engaged and excited about what Dexter does behind these doors. So I got to switch my glasses to my official safety goggles and here we go. Wish me luck. Let's start by learning about the steel. My name is Gary Gogan. I manage engineering here. All right, I'm told it all happens right here. Dexter starts at a place that other companies don't think about from a holistic control point of view. Well, you know, one of the benefits to uh, doing it all under one roof is our control of the raw materials that go into it. So we have very tight control. Gary, why is the steel important? What exactly is Dex steel and why do you make it special? Dex steel is the result of, of a development between our steel manufacturer and uh, Dexter Know-How. We, we what we want to do is use the absolute finest cutlery steel available. We know what properties we need, and and we were thrilled that our man, our steel manufacturer is willing to work with us and formulate a steel that maximizes the performance we're looking for, and we know our customers are looking for. You you definitely are looking for superior corrosion resistance. You are looking for superior hardness. You are looking for superior uh, edge retention. The trouble is, if you push any one of those characteristics, you will tend to diminish the other. So, so deck steel is an optimization of those three primary characteristics and, and optimizing and maximizing the performance of all three of them simultaneously. So our intention is to have the best corrosion, corrosion resistance that we possibly can. So what we are doing is absolutely optimizing the precise hardness that we want that will give that nice balance between retaining the edge while at the same time allowing them to be able to bring that sharpness back through sharpening and stealing. Now that we're up to speed on the steel, let's find out more about the equipment used to create knives. I'm TJ Kennedy. I'm a mechanical engineer at Dexter and I design and build specialty equipment to make make our knives the way that we do. Okay, and how did you end up here? What did How did you end up at Dexter? You don't so, look 200 years old, so I'm assuming you didn't come with the building. Exactly. <laughs> so in trade school, I, I went for machining and so I got a co-op here when I was 18 years old. So I went, I worked in maintenance, uh -huh. so I worked on all the machinery down here and fixed problems and made parts to fix the machines to keep them going. And now what do you do? So at school, I, uh, while I was working, I went to school at night. Yeah. And Dexter paid for me to go to school <laughs> for my engineering degree. And then I came back as a mechanical engineer. So now I design machinery and I've designed and built a few different machines here. 
uh, that are specialty. Like we can't buy them out anywhere else. We have to design them in-house. So you basically created a piece of the system that keeps everything made right here. Correct. How does that make you feel knowing that if you see a, a Dexter knife or, or flipper or slicer in somebody's hand, you must feel like, oh my God, I made the machine that does that. Yeah, so one of the machines that I made was a polishing machine on paring knives. And in the last year we did over, that machine produced over a million blades. Really? So when I'm out in a restaurant or I can see somebody using the paring knife with the polish on it, and it's you can go, hey, I, I made that. That's unbelievable. So it's a it's a good feeling to know that the machine is making the quality part, and the consumer's happy. They're yep. using it, and they don't know that I made the polish, and that's why it's unique. But to me, I can see that they're appreciating it. Yeah, and it, it, it it's almost like it becomes a story for you, right? Because you're seeing it in action, like you're seeing the culmination of what happens in this building, and knowing you had a piece of that. I mean, I think my wife's over it. All right, next, let's talk to the plant managers to learn more about how the knives are actually made and see the process in action. My name is uh, Greg Majewski. Uh, I'm the, currently the plant manager. My name is David Lucier, uh, first floor department manager. We have some healthy competition with the rest of the managers in the factory here, so I like to let them know that the first floor makes the knives and everyone else just pretties them up for me. <laughs> You could put the best package on the knife, the best handle, use the best steel, polish it pretty, but if your heat treat isn't correct, all, none of that matters, because that's, that's, where, that's where the heart of the knife is. There's a few parts to heat treating. The first part is the hardening process. The initial hardening process, we are slowly heating those blades up to 1,995 degrees Fahrenheit. Is that the temperature? That's the, the temperature. Sun? Some might say this. Pretty close, though. <laughs> What's happening during that hardening phase is these elements are starting to um, dissolve and they're starting to um, bind with the, with the carbon that's in our blades. And what's happening is the crystal structure of the steel is starting to form. And you start to get that really tight, um, grain, that tight microstructure that, that we're looking for. Um, it's called the, the martensitic phase of the steel. It's, it's the hardest point that we can get that steel to. Um, that's, that's what's going to allow you to, to have your sharp edges with that, with that microstructure and, and have your, your flexibility, your, your ductility, your um, abrasion resistance. It's, it's, it's a hard piece of steel. Um, the best thing that I, I like to compare it to folks that don't understand heat treat is um, you watch the movies, you got the medieval guy, the, the blacksmith forging the sword, he's got the sword in the fire, he's putting it in the fire, that's what's happening. And the next step of that process is the quench process. The quench would be that blacksmith putting that sword into a bucket of water. All right, the quench process is important because that martensitic phase that's happening, that, that bonding of all the elements to the carbon, the quench phase is that rapid cooling. So we rapid air cool, the blade to about 1300, 1350 degrees, and it locks the blade in that martensitic state, its hardest state. So now we have that, that blade captured right where we want. All right, let's move on to what's next. Oh man, the freezer. I don't see any ice cream in here though. No ice cream, but it cools beer real quick. <laughs> so what's going on in here? So right now it comes out of the main heat treat furnace, and this is our cryogenic freeze where we're actually really locking in uh, the elements in solution when it comes out of the heat treat furnaces. So this is a step that is going to strengthen the heat and quench process yep. one step further. Yep, this is our uh, extra process to make sure that everything was done just right in the heat treat process. And just a question, how cold is this compared to a regular conventional freezer? This goes down to a negative 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Negative 120, that's cold. So what I've heard is flexibility is everything. Is just right flexibility also achieved through the hardening, quenching, and deep freeze process? Flex point is all grinding. 
So that grind is product specific. So are, are we are we going to be grinding a a fillet knife where it's a very we're take we're moving a lot of material so we have that flex? Are we grinding a butcher a butcher's knife where where we're not, where we're going to be removing less material where it's going to be a heavier back on the blade with with um, with less with less material taken off for an edge? Grinding is the foundation. It's just like building a house. If you don't have a strong foundation then your house is gonna crumble. You have your initial dimensions of your grind. And then our next step is we're cracking that initial edge down to a, to a diamond or a, or a TP uh, shape. And then in that dimension, is that, that's a specific angle that we put on our blade. And then the final step after polishing and cleaning and, and uh, assembly is we put a razor sharp honed edge on that. So with a properly ground blade to the right thickness, that initial break edge or kennel edge, and a final razor sharp hone, you're, you're allowed to do things like this. All right, I've been to the Dexter factory and I've seen how all this is made. And now I'm here with Joshua. Good to see you. Joshua, you are a chef, and you're gonna show me all these items in action and how these utensils are used in your world. And we're gonna talk about what they can do to make your life easier, how to care for them, everything you need to know. Sound good? Let's have some fun. All right, let's go. All right, Josh, let's get this started right. I see you've got a chef's knife in front of you. I wanna know, why is this important to you? How does this make your life easier as a chef? Well, you know, this is the tool that we use almost all day in the kitchens. The chef's knife has to be very uh, useful to cut a wide variety of things. So here you can see I have an onion in front of me, but oftentimes we find that this is the only tool we have. So it has to be very versatile. And you have it in your hands all day long. Let's talk about how it feels. I might be working on one task for several hours at a time, Again, with onions, tomatoes, you find yourself cutting through bags and bags and boxes sure. of these things. So if it doesn't feel right, then you know, right from the start, it, it kind of you know, hinders your, your work in the kitchen. But this one I can feel has the right weight to it. The handle feels really well molded to my hand and uh, you know, works well for the pinch grip as well. You get the tip of the knife on the cutting board and you saw down and rock on the cutting board. You know, that shape of the chef knife helps to um, you know, just really get things precisely yeah, done. Yeah, look at that. One other thing I want to show you is with the tip of the knife, if I wanted to dice this onion, see how I can just go straight through to the cutting board? Yep. It feels like it's very well sharpened in all parts of the blade. It feels like it's the right size and shape. You know, it also has just a very sharp edge. All right, Joshua, next up, it looks like the paring knife. Tell me about this. This is just such a, a useful tool. It's really essential to do things like de-seeding, peeling, using uh, a knife to cut small fruits and vegetables like strawberries. It's important to be able to not only make a cut on the cutting board like you can with this, but also to be able to pick it up and do this kind of pairing motion, right? That's why it's called a pairing knife. So we have our tops that we can take off. This is something that we do really frequently in a kitchen, making things like garnishes very important to be able to have a smaller blade for a little more finesse. So it's really useful to do little things like that. Again, you can slice with it, you can hold it in hand, and you can even use the very edge of the knife to do things. Okay guys, I recognize this from my factory tour. That is the scalloped utility knife. Now what's important about it? How does it make your life easier as a chef? This is something that I would, I would use if I was cutting through a ripe fruit or vegetable. Something with a soft interior, but a skin that needs to be pierced. Like a tomato. Exactly. Something that I don't really want to compress while I'm cutting. So, you know, the peaks and valleys of the blade here help to pierce the skin, but slice the, the soft interior. Okay, so how does that differ from, say, a serrated edge? Sure, the serrated edge has more of kind of saw teeth to it. Okay. So that would rip your food. If I'm going for presentation, if I'm going for clean cuts, then I really want something that has the peaks and valleys. All right, Joshua, you broke out the chicken, and I see next to it we have the stiff boning knife. Yep. Tell me how this works. Why is this important when you're dealing with something like chicken? 
Well, you know, the profile of the knife is really important to help you get into tight spots without cutting up uh, the pieces of meat that you want to preserve for presentation. Okay. It's also nice that it has a rigid blade to it because if I want to maximize yield and get a really precise cut, sometimes I need to use a little bit of force around the blade in joints to, to separate things out. This split chicken, for instance, if I wanted to separate this and get a quartered chicken, I might use the blade to kind of push this leg quarter away from the breast. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to keep the skin closer to the breast, which is going to be my high yield presentation cut. Okay. So the, the rigidity of this blade is really important for cuts like that. Got it. And I, and I saw when you, when you um, have the chicken or started to have the chicken, you went through the backbone. I could hear it going through the bone, right. the small rib bones, almost right. like it was no problem Absolutely. at all. Absolutely. And you know, part of that is just how sharp this blade is, but the other part is exactly as you mentioned there, how it's a rigid blade. Now this cut doesn't really have too much bone to go through, so you okay. can see here, as I start to push away from the breast, oh, wow. do you see yeah. how using the rigid blade is helpful? It's almost like having an additional hand on the cutting board. Okay, Joshua, I see you broke out the bone-in ham, and you've got the flexible boning knife. First thing I want to know is what's the difference between the stiff boning knife and the flexible boning knife well, when you're doing you something like that? You can see here, if I were to put pressure down, you see how the bend? Yeah. Yeah. The bend happens. So that's something that's been engineered into this knife to be able to really help a cook cut something that has a bone in it. So this is a cooked item, a bone in ham. But okay. You know, you can also use this for raw elements. Let's say you had the actual ham before it was cooked and you had to take some of the meat off. You could use this same knife. Okay. So what are we going to do here? So you can see that there's a bone running down the middle and there's sure. actually a knuckle right here in, in the middle. Okay. Once you've cooked this, you really want to maximize your yield. So if you're a cook that has to take the meat off in order to slice it, maybe for a buffet or mm -hmm. for sandwiches, you want to be able to apply pressure to a knife and see that it reacts. Oh, so you can see as, okay. I go, as I go down the bone here, I'm actually flexing the blade to try to cut as close to the bone as possible. It's almost like it contours to the bone for you. Exactly. Okay. And if I make this entire cut, what you'll see is that you see how it kind of goes right around the knuckle. And I don't have to worry about steering the knife as much as I do just putting a little bit of pressure on the edge and the knife does most of that work for me. And you're creating the separation. Okay, exactly. yeah. Exactly. So oh, that's interesting. It's the same shape as the bone. That's okay. right. It's contouring itself. And as I pull the meat away, you can that. see that it leaves the bone very clean. It is and, down to the bone. And I get <laughs> all of that usable meat. So if this was a buffet item, now I've just upped my yield. All right, Joshua, we're over here by the grill. We're bringing the heat, and we've got burgers on, we've got onions on, we've got the sizzle going. I see you have two turners here. Why are these important for your grilling? What are they gonna make it easier to do? These are really nice because they have beveled edges to them. Okay. So you can not only turn things on a flat top or a grill, but you can also use the edge to chop. Oh, okay. And we're going to see that in action. And I see that this one has holes in it. What is the purpose for that? That's right. So I'm going to give you this one while I do some chopping. But okay. this, this has some slots in it so that as you pick things up that have natural juices or grease, it can it trips can come right through. out. Right. And the other thing I noticed is that it's got a lot of bend to it. Yeah. So take a look as I, as I turn these burgers, I can really get underneath it to make sure that Oh, and the bend, nice is allowing you, the bend is allowing you to get that flex and, and get you, under it. If you can think that's really important for things like this, but it's also really important for delicate items. Let's say you're turning a piece of fish and you want to make sure that you don't lose the top to it. You sure. need to get underneath and that, that feature is really important. The beveled edge is nice to be able to chop things. So you can see here I have onions that I'm going to be serving with the burgers. Yeah, you don't even have to you don't even have to worry about breaking out a knife. You could just use the utensil that you're already using. Exactly. And you know the important thing for that too is you wouldn't want to use a knife on this surface. Oh no God! No! Please no! So by having this tool built in, it really keeps your other tools just as sharp and just as just as maintained as they need to be. Got it. All right, Joshua. Every chef knows that a sharp knife is important, but what's happening when your knife dulls and why do you need something like the diamond sharpener 
to get that back to where you want it. Right, this is really a very important tool in knife ownership. And what we can imagine with the edge of the knife is that there's a feather of steel that comes out to form your edge. As you use it repetitively, that bends over. And so okay. in order to maintain that, it's important to use the steel to straighten that back out. To right. get it back up like this from this. Exactly. Okay. But as you do that repetitively, the edge wears away. Okay. So it's important to know that this is a two-in-one tool where the diamond edge will help to set a new edge by grinding away metal. Okay, and it straightens as well. That's right, and then it creates a, a brand new edge for you. All right, so how do you do it? What's the best way to do it to make sure that your edge is always sharp and your knife is straight? Sure, so I'd hold, I'd hold this tool firmly and I'd start with the heel of the blade. Yep. You wanna hold the knife at about a 20 degree angle here. So if that's 90 degrees, half of that's 45, and then another is 20. You wanna maintain that angle as you make a slow and steady and consistent Got it. Movement. And I noticed that. you go right from the heel of the knife all the way to the point. That's not right. missing any end. That's right. And when we do that, it's important to know that it has a finger protector here because you want to use the entire length of the steel and sharpen the entire length of the blade. All in one stroke. That's Got right. it. And then it looks like you just alternate back and forth to keep that edge coming up straight and sharpening it consistently on both sides. Exactly. And so if you're just trying to use this as a steel, you would go ahead and pass it a few times on either edge. But if you want to really set some pressure on that, that's when you can grind metal away and create a new edge. Got it. I've heard that some institutions use rental companies, rental companies, rental companies, rental companies to take care of their knives. What do you think about that? R rental companies are there and you know, it's an expensive option. Hmm. I have to tell you, you can buy a nice set of knives, you can get a variety of different tools and it's gonna be much cheaper in the long run. I can buy a set of knives a couple of times over for the cost of using a rental company for a year and then you're in control of the tools that you're using. You get to pick exactly which knives work for the jobs you're doing. Sometimes the rental companies will have a chef knife, but they might not have a utility blade or a particular type of boning knife. So you're at the mercy of what's available, whereas there's a, a wide variety of, of Dexter knives available for each task you're gonna be doing. It's also really nice to be able to sharpen your knife when you need it. Mm. Because if you're renting, you've got a schedule that, that's gonna be maintained, which means you may go several days using a dull blade and that's not good for the, the customer, it's not good for the food product, and it's not good for the person using the tool either. Yeah, I think what we talked about was the fact that it slows you down and it affects your yield exactly. without that sharpness. So the knife care really becomes important. And you said something important there, you have control. That's right. And that's something that I think is important. If I were using one of these and owned it, I'd wanna make sure that it is taken care of for me the right way. Exactly. You can also buy a variety of different colors if you're implementing a HACCP plan to keep things safe. These are all NSF certified. And like you said, having the control of picking the tools and keeping them sharp and maintaining them properly is in your hands. That's a great perspective on rental. And it sounds like all the reason in the world to own your own. Yeah, absolutely. Joshua, I have had so much fun today learning about all this and seeing how you put these utensils into action. Thanks for your time and I can't wait to eat your food. Hey. Thanks so much, it's been fun talking to you. Last but not least, let's check in with Dexter's CEO, Alan Peppel. Alan, thank you so much for having me today. I have seen an unbelievable amount of incredible stuff in terms of how much goes into creating these products. 200 years gives you an incredible knowledge base. The amount of experience that I've heard about today and best practices that were actually established in this building years ago are still practiced today. And I guess I wonder, that must really speak to the quality of what you're creating because you have a process that accounts for every single quality assurance step. You, it's like you have the stop gaps in place to make sure that every single knife when it makes its slice in somebody's hands is the same experience every time. We do that, but I think, I think that we have to be careful that 200 years of experience isn't something we just sit back and rest our laurels on. Sure. We have to ch always challenge ourselves that we, as, and it's one of the things that I think drives us as an organization, as manufacturers, is that I am, I am convinced that if we work as a team, 
we can together prove that U.S. manufacturing is alive and well, and we're not just, and that we can indeed thrive and be great, great vendors for our customers and, and manufacturers of product. But to do that, we always have to be challenging ourselves. How can we do it better? How can we do it smarter? How can we do it more efficiently and more productively? So we, we have all the quality that we expect, but we're still doing it faster and leaner and getting it out the door. Yeah. Because the world isn't waiting for us. We have to, we have to be innovating and pushing and going forward. Fascinating. Well, I want to thank you for showing me Dexter Russell and everything that you guys do. It was really incredible. Well, thanks, Mike. Great having you here. Thank you. Wow. That was incredible. I got to see how the steel is heat treated for a blade. I got to see how they put the flex points into a blade. I got to see how they put the final edge on the blade. I got to see a chef using all of the blades and showing me how to use them right. And most importantly, I got to meet employees who love what they do and believe in Dexter Russell and what they create. They really do create the tools that are imperative to every chef. If you're looking for the right utensil, Dexter Russell has got what you need. Have a great day, and thanks for taking this tour with me.